the connection with fruit and what is what is our, what is our connection with fruit in your opinion and how does that factor in with this whole scenario well this this is going back to origins and or mechanisms that could possibly explain this proposal um, and one area i was looking at which i've already mentioned was uh, the current thinking on human origins the kind of modern disciplines of anthropology primatology and so on mm -hmm. And one of the things that struck me, and again, I had a little bit of background in plant sciences quite early on, that there was something unique in our origins, and it's written about and it's accepted, but the context is such that it's it's almost the potential importance, I think, has been missed. Um, and that being that, um, again, it, it's pretty much accepted primate lineage great apes and so on, by degrees formed relationships with the flowering plants. Mm -hmm. um, that would be the, the flowering trees, the, the tropical forest. That's, you know, that's, uh, that's a central part of modern primatology and anthropology. No real argument there. Um, and within that, we formed a, what turns out to be an incredibly rare relationship with the reproductive organs of the flowering plants. Um, so I haven't got quite to saying fruit yet. I'm trying to <laughs> yeah, because we're all so familiar with fruit. Um, right, see, whatever, whatever your, whatever your take on it, you know, it's yeah, it's something you, you need. It's a healthy snack. Obviously, some people like you know the kind of people you're familiar with. It's become something that they eat a lot of because they believe it's 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 really important and so on. But it's actually the plant's reproductive organ. Yeah. Okay. So. For a um, for a typical mammal to form a relationship, and they're, they're generally termed symbiotic relationships, you know the terminology exists, and again this has been written about, to form uh, a long-term relationship with the reproductive organs of not even a closely related species, but of a whole other kingdom, the plant kingdom. Incredibly rare. I mean, a lot of species will eat fruit, mm -hmm. but they'll only do it seasonally, and in the higher latitudes, you get fruit for three, four, five, six months of the year if you're lucky. The one place you can get fruit 24-7 for evolutionary time scales, at least in theory, is the equatorial forest. Right. Forest pretty close to the equator. And even there, there are sort of ecological niches within that. So not even the um, all the equatorial forest, it's the non-seasonal equatorial forest where basically you get very little climate change. It's kind of conducive then to having fruit all the year round so you're not even getting fruit in the wet season or the dry season or whatever it's just 24 7 and that's the only place um that this whole symbiotic relationship could have had a, the kind of impact i'm talking about it would have had to be in very long term and potentially quite stable mm -hmm. um and our physiology basically fits that i mean there's lots of theories about where we evolved and clearly we did spend time and still do spend time in in all sorts of environments but the this connection with fruit, um, if it did have an impact on our evolution and and um, ultimately the emergence of our large brain and all the associated traits that go with that, that could only have been in the non-seasonal equatorial forests, almost certainly in Africa. All the evidence points to Africa. So relatively small area in the grand scheme of things. Um, and again, back to your, your point, well, fruit... It's a reproductive, a reproductive organ, and it uh, it contains a whole array of biochemistry that is relatively relatively unique. It's mm -hmm. it's there's a lot of hormonally active compounds in there, and they can change all sorts of things. They can change our periods of development. You know how how early or how late we go into sexual maturity, which has an impact on brain development. They can change the way the DNA is read completely. The DNA is like um, it's like a code; it doesn't do anything on its own. It's how it's read. Well, for the most part, DNA is read by hormones. Our own hormones would include things like testosterone and estrogens. Well, plants have a whole bunch of hormonal, hormonally active compounds that, if you ingest them, they change the way our own hormones work or they directly read the DNA differently. So there, there was basically something in our past that stood out to me. Once you change 
the familiar framework. So yes, primate seed fruit, they disseminate the seeds, very well written about, very well understood, and that's considered a, a symbiotic relationship of sorts anyway. Yeah. So, well, hang on, we were ingesting the reproductive organs and effectively, and I stress the word effectively, immersing ourselves in the reproductive environment of a whole other kingdom. Now that is crazy unusual right. in terms of how the vast majority of other species have evolved. Incredibly unique. So, I, you know, I, again, when you're looking for clues, you think, well, what's unique here? What's unusual? And that stood out as something very unique. It's written about, it's understood. But I think what had been missed, be, again, because of the reductionist nature of the way we look at these things, you know, you'll have the anthropologists who would accept that. You'd have the primatologists who would accept that. But very few of them would necessarily have the pharmacology uh, and the botany to understand what that might mean in terms of how one thing impacts on the other. Um, and then by the time you get to, to the neurologists and neuroscientists, they tend to look at the brain as if it fell out of the sky. Well, how does it work? There's not so much cross-referencing with the disciplines that look at our origins. And even there, they're missing these other components. So it's really trying to paint a more complete picture and then look for unusual elements and could it have had an impact. So fruit, that's why I think fruit's special. It's it's the reproductive organ of the angiosperms, of the flowering plants, and we formed a very special relationship with it and we were flooding our system with the reproductive biochemistry yeah. of this other kingdom. I, I know I've said that a couple of times, yeah. so I just want to emphasize it. So that's why fruit's very different. And, and the evidence suggests that we spent many millions of years in this relationship again symbiotic relationships what what you end up with in principle is instead of having your your archaic mammal or primate and the tree or trees you start losing the separateness they become a symbiotic organism to some degree that's kind of the definition so you're not talking then about primate and forest you're talking about this symbiotic organism where during that process of evolution they become the same yeah and therefore the plant biochemistry becomes an integral and essential part of what was the mammal or the primate biochemistry they're not separate anymore uh, and and again the evidence suggests that process went on for a, a very long time what i think has happened is people have looked for for when that broke down because there's, there's this kind of preconception that in order to grow a big grain a brain and to become intelligent you need hostile environments like hunting the savanna all this kind of stuff so wherever there's been evidence of human ancestors living outside the forest that's been seized upon as evidence okay well this is when we left and that's when things got really cool we built the big brain and so on but actually that's just one interpretation there's there's no there's no sort of reason why you wouldn't get those kind of examples of populations living outside the forest the question is did they represent all the lineages were there possibly lineages still living in the forest for much longer and much later than we currently recognize challenge there is tropical forests aren't very good at laying down fossils you know there's right. not an awful lot of evidence and it's it's not convenient i didn't conjure that up you know people have said oh well it's just it's just handy that fossil evidence doesn't occur so <laughs> Well, that's true, but any theory that's based on equatorial forests is going to have that problem. And I, yeah, as far as I'm aware, you know, we know chimp chimpanzees exist. There's a fair population of them. They actually inhabit a range of environments from tropical forests to more savanna-like areas. And I think thus far, there's only two or three verified chimpanzee fossils, you know, so it's actually quite difficult to find right. fossils. So the idea that there may have been human ancestors that stayed for longer in the forest isn't this isn't negated by the findings right the, uh, more savannah like sort of you know it, it doesn't preclude the possibility so i'm saying that maybe this symbiotic relationship went on for a lot longer than we recognize uh currently well as you say it's in the it's in the the traditions in the oral traditions as you're saying the garden of eden these kind of ideas there is there's a there's a, a harking back in our consciousness to some well, well, yes, and that's why, I mean, again, it's certainly not proof, but it's intriguing they exist at all. Yeah. Um, and, and for sure, I quite like the sort of that Judaic Christian tradition, although quite where it really comes from, who's to say? Certainly some people would suggest it's, you know, it, it's much older and much earlier than that. Um, who knows? But certainly, I, not surprisingly, I quite like the idea of 
human genesis having something to do with a forest and even specifically fruit, which is mentioned, because um, it ties in very well. It may be totally irrelevant, I don't know, but it's mm. it's uh, it's intriguing that it exists. Yeah. 